lot going on. I'd like to introduce Christy Horton, who is the moderator of tonight. And Christy, it's all yours. Welcome. So tonight's topic, breaking te breakthrough technology in diabetes treatment, couldn't be more timely. Um, diabetes, as Guy mentioned, is the largest non-infectious chronic disease in the world today. And the president highlighted the need for a new era of medicine um, in diabetes treatment in his State of the Union address last night when he launched his Precision Medicine Initiative. This life-changing medical technology known as the artificial pancreas system or systems has been developed right here on the Central Coast. It's arguably the most significant advance since local scientists isolated insulin here. It's available today and is poised to revolutionize disease management. We're extremely fortunate to have a panel of leading experts in the field here tonight uh, to discuss the technology and the opportunities around these breakthroughs. Our keynote speaker is Professor Frank Doyle. He's the department chair and professor of chemical engineering at UCSB. He was named Santa Barbara's 2000, uh, 2012 Innovator of the Year for the worldwide impact of his bioengineering R&D of artificial pancreas technology for type 1 diabetes patients. Well, Christy, thank you for the kind introduction. Thank you for the invitation tonight. Thank you all for coming out to hear about this exciting work. I chose the title, Engineering the Artificial Pancreas, to reflect the fact that I'm trained as an engineer. I've enjoyed a delightful partnership with doctors here in Santa Barbara. So this really has been a labor of love between doctors and engineers, and we often refer to it as medically inspired engineering. And you'll get a sense for that as I walk through this. For those of you not familiar, um, Christy touched on this, diabetes is a worldwide problem. You see some of the numbers here on the screen, worldwide, um, close to 400 million people with diabetes. Uh, in the US, about 37 million, about two thirds of them know it, and about a third of them are undiagnosed as of yet. It's, um, healthcare costs in the US alone run north of $240 billion a year from the direct costs associated with treating diabetes and then treating the complications of diabetes as well. So it's a, a terrible affliction. Um, in California here, it's a huge burden as well. One in seven Californians have diabetes. Again, about two thirds of them um, are aware of that. They've been diagnosed and, and about a third of them are not diagnosed. So that's about four million people here in our state. And the, the annual healthcare costs in California run somewhere around $25 billion, again, for the direct cost associated with diabetes as well as the treatment of the complications of diabetes. So I'm gonna show you a cartoon of how one does this, and I'll try to do this without any equations, which is hard for an engineering professor, but here's the idea. Imagine that this vertical line right here is now. This is the present time. Everything to the left is the past. I know what my blood sugars have been. I know what my insulin pump has been doing. I now wanna predict the future. I wanna make a forecast into the future of where that blood sugar is gonna go. And in one version of our algorithm, if the blood sugar stays in the green zone, we do nothing. The doctors would say the subject has good control of their glucose, so we don't need to modulate the insulin pump, let the pump continue to deliver what it's doing now. But if in the future, as we step forward, we learn that we predict their blood sugars will go high, they just had a meal, then we're gonna adjust the insulin delivery to put more insulin in the body to cancel the high blood sugars that are coming. And we'll step forward in time, we'll move this line from left to right as we get new information. So I might calculate for the next two hours what that insulin should be, but in five minutes when I get a new measurement, I'm gonna repeat the whole process. This is what we call in engineering terms a receding horizon algorithm. Now for the engineers in the audience, here's the one and only equation I'm gonna put up. <laughs> Savor it, that's it. Now, for the rest of you who aren't engineers, I described an algorithm where I forecast many moves in the future, I collected a measurement, and I repeated the whole process. Does that remind anybody of a, a game? Many moves in the future, but you only get to do one? Chess, right? The grandmasters make many moves ahead, the opponent moves, they have to repeat the strategy. So this is very much like the strategy of chess a receding horizon framework, but we're forecasting about 12 moves ahead. So that would be um, not quite in Deep Blue's uh, domain of uh, competing the computer that uh, defeated uh, Kasparov, but 
chess masters, I guess, would be up in that range. Okay, so the other piece of this puzzle that we've done at UCSB, in particular Al Dassau, who's sitting here in the audience, has been to make a platform to let us do testing of devices in the clinic. So we've made a very neutral, if you will, operating system that connects a variety of pumps from different companies, a variety of sensors from different companies, and they're in a shared platform where now one can take an algorithm, one can plug in using a very modular design and test control under different clinical scenarios. And really, this wouldn't have happened if I hadn't moved here 13 years ago and discovered the wonderful doctors at the Sansom Clinic. They have remarkable facilities here for a, for a small town medical clinic. Some of you may know, it was mentioned in the introduction, that this is where insulin was first administered in the U.S. in the 1920s. The first place in the U.S. was right here in Santa Barbara, shortly after the first place in the world in Canada by Banting and Best. So we have facilities at Sanson where we can test these algorithms. We can very quickly go from the aha in the engineer's mind out at UCSB to talking to doctors, testing, implementing this in the trial. So um, the first one is, so when can individuals actually buy this? And understanding that perhaps this is, uh, means more than one thing. And also given that individuals with diabetes range a lot from uh, young children to teens to adults, all walks of life, who are going to be the, do you think, are going to be the first users of this technology? I'll take this since I'm attempting to commercialize the technology and that really is a question about commercialization. I'm hopeful that we can, we can get FDA approval within the next five years. However, it's important to add that we will not, um, we will not want to sell a product unless we have 100% confidence not only in its efficacy but in its safety. So as, as was mentioned many times, getting FDA approval and um, takes an enormous amount of time and money and then moving towards um, insurance and reimbursement and things like that are huge tasks. And often what happens is um, the initial investors get washed out of the process. So I'm hoping you can address that question a little bit and talk about the challenges. Very good question, uh, and one I have some experience with. Now, there's another company that actually was based on USB, UCSB technology, originally Cytomics, and it was split in two. We have John, at least one investor here, John Patodi, uh, and we were squeezed down uh, about five years ago by Third Rock Capital, which is, uh, was originally based in Boston, still is. But they were the people who built Millennium Pharmaceutical. And so the original angel investors um, uh, ended up with uh, about 10% of the company. Uh, Cytomics just now, during JP Morgan's uh, week, uh, completed a uh, financing at a pre-money of 110, post-money of 130 million and led by Pfizer, and uh, Pfizer has also done a joint venture with us to develop four drugs, where they gave us $25 million up front, no equity, just for the right to do it, and um, uh, well, $635 million in bio bucks, which means meeting my milestones, which I guess 40 to 60 percent is um, uh, and we have, did last year a deal with um, BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb, 50 million up front, again, to collaborate on four drugs. Uh, so it's biotech, so you never really know, but uh, uh, the original investors, the angels who are perhaps getting a little impatient at this point, uh, can look forward to the possibility of a very, very large return. Fundamentally, uh, what, what cytomics does is allow uh, antibodies to be targeted only at the disease tissues. Therefore, the side effects are minimized. And very fortunate, by the way, luck is good too. Uh, fortunately for us, the um, newest cancer technologies are uh, actually designed to kill the cancer, not block a pathway. Thank you, everybody. Very interesting uh, presentations. 
you've talked about this for type 1 diabetes. Are there apl applications to people with type 2 diabetes that are using insulin? So there's a fraction, a small fraction, though, of the subjects who have type 2 diabetes that would benefit from insulin therapy. Um, by and large, it's really nutrition and exercise for individuals with type 2. So I think um, more pharmaceutical research, the kind of work that Fred's involved in, and um, drug discovery is really the frontier that people are hoping to conquer for type 2 for the large uh, portion of the population. But certainly there are um, individuals with type 2, there are individuals who um, have had their pancreas removed, perhaps pancreatic cancer, who could benefit from insulin dosing. So there are other, other opportunities beyond individuals with type 1, but considerably smaller uh, demographic. I th there's a very interesting study uh, that w was published in The Lancet a number of years ago where they took patients with t newly diagnosed type 2 diabetes, a couple hundred patients, half of them they hospitalized for one month, put them on insulin, which regularized their blood sugar for one month. The other half they sent home with normal care. At the end of the year, and then they, after the month, the patients who had been in the hospital on insulin got sent home. And what they discovered is that a year, two years later, the people who had gotten insulin early and then gone off it had done a lot better. And so that's a very active area of research in type 2 diabetes. And it, there's this hypothesis that high blood sugar, which is caused by diabetes in, in, in type 2 diabetes, then destroys the pancreatic beta cells and leads to a worsening of the disease. So there is a potential for using this technology, I think, uh, to arrest the progression of type 2 diabetes, but that's still in the research stage. And actually, if I could add to that, there's one other application that we've been in discussions with some doctors in LA about, which is the procedure of transplanted islets. So one um, therapy for type 1 diabetes would be to transplant islets. Um, into an individual with type 1 and hope that they would take and not be rejected by the body. The transition from the initial transplant to getting productive beta cells is a, a rocky period of a couple days, and the doctors have approached us about using the artificial pancreas to bridge that window, to maybe supplement that insulin so that the beta cells that are transplanted are more viable. So there are a number of different ways that you could spin this to support other problems like the kind that Tom mentioned. I believe we have a question here. Hi, Paul Strasma. I'm an entrepreneur in the glucose sensor space and a former colleague of Tom's. Um, I guess nice, my nice question to, is following nice up. Nice to see you, Paul. Good to see Tom. <laughs> to follow up on the industry dynamics, I thought you might want to talk a little bit more about the fact that there's two sensor companies, four pump companies that kind of dominate this space, have their own technologies already that they're building on. Um, how do you foresee this developing? Is this going to be something that's licensed out to one of those dominant players? Is this something that there's a business model to actually serve multiple competitors all trying to gain a leg up on one another? Our vision actually is to develop software that could reside in any insulin pump from any insulin pump company. So it's sort of, um, I believe in business school, it's referred to as the Intel inside model. Um, and the reason I think that's a reasonable strategy here is that there, there are three or four insulin pump companies. They're all differentiated by the different visions that the pump companies have about how to best deliver insulin. Uh, see, my name is Kitch Wilson. I'm a biomedical engineer. I do endocrine system modeling as well as feedback control, although not in glucose. And my question has to do with this is actually a, a two output system you have glucose and you have insulin and you have glucagon. And you've only talked about insulin. Are you doing anything with glucagon? To your specific question of glucagon, at the present time, there is not a stable formulation of glucagon that can last for long periods outside of, say, a refrigerator at room temperature and a pump. There are a number of very clever individuals working on this, trying to come up with a better formulation of glucagon that can survive in solution for long periods. And I'm confident that that problem will get solved in a matter of years, presumably. But at the present time, it's not feasible to put on a product to go on the market.